I'm Alistair Chang. I'm an advisory board member of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, and I'm also a board member of Bibliothèque Sans Frontières. And I'm here with two literacy champions. I'll pass over to you to introduce yourselves, and please also share where you're calling from. So my name is Sana Johnson. I'm the regional vice president uh, for the International Rescue Committee covering the Asia region uh, for us. And presently, I'm in Den Haag, Netherlands. My name is Naim Sohit. Uh, I'm based in uh, Pakistan, Islamabad, and basic, basically worked as a chief of party Pakistan Reading Project. Congratulations on winning the international prize this year. Thank Would you. love to hear how uh, what this means to you. I mean, uh, undoubtedly for, for us at the International Rescue Committee, it, it's a sense of uh, amazement, uh, pride, uh, hopefulness, uh, because it is um, in a way sign of that the interventions we are doing for millions of children globally actually have an effect. And we are joining hand with many other actors to promote literacy. And for us to, to be able to give reading skills to a child, it is like opening up for the future. And of course, investing in teacher is a long-term and sustainable investment. So we are just deeply honored and thankful uh, for the recognition. And uh, yes, we just want to say super thank you. Yeah, uh, this award uh, really means a lot to us. Uh, this award means that PRP is duly recognized uh, as a unique and inspiring model uh, for other organizations interested in literacy promotion. Uh, a project that has made sustainable difference uh, towards benefiting millions of children. Uh, we reached about 1.7 million grade one and two student uh, throughout Pakistan during the course of this project uh, across the country. And these are the children who will go on to be the leaders and readers of tomorrow. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your work? <coughs> and what are some of the opportunities and challenges that you're seeing? Yeah, for uh, Basically, Pakistan Reading Project was designed uh, uh, for a regular sort of uh, schooling uh, and supporting teachers uh, in their classroom. And that's what we were doing for the last six years uh, when uh, COVID pandemic really hit Pakistan in March uh, 2020. So USAID, our donor, uh, they approached us, uh, uh, what can we do while schools are closed? So I think uh, initially it was really a, a challenging task uh, because we were doing sort of regular things and most of our staff was also stuck at home. Uh, so we did take uh, two decisions at that time uh, to convert this challenge into an opportunity at that time. Uh, during uh, you know, the life of project, we developed uh, tons of material, uh, reading learning material. Uh, which uh, from the very beginning, uh, we developed all this material in coordination with provincial, regional and federal government. So they were already approved, uh, you know, recognized and uh, already being used in the classrooms. Uh, teachers were familiar with that. Uh, so literally during the course of project, we trained 27,000 teachers. As I shared earlier, uh, reached to about 1.7 million students. And when we say, you know, reaching 27,000 teacher or 1.7 million teacher, it's not like a one shot activity. So we are really talking about when we interact a student or approach a student or a teacher, then we stay with them at least for two academic years. Uh, so all that material was available uh, and in a digital form too. So the very first decision we took uh, built upon what you already have. Second thing was uh, we already were in, you know, in touch with our teachers, all these 27,000 teachers and thousands of community members. Uh, we do have their uh, mobile numbers and we used to send them SMS messages uh, with different tapes and all these sort of things. So we, we thought built everything upon that. So the very first thing we did basically, uh, we turned that challenge into an opportunity in a way the material which was available to us, we started sending those stories, uh, a big book we call them, and these were very local stories in five languages. Uh, so initially we started sending them in Urdu and in Sindhi, uh, because these are the languages uh, of instruction in majority of Pakistani school. Uh, and very soon we realized uh, that these are only, you know, texts. 
So, but we also had a lot of pictures uh, uh, in our big books, in our reading learning materials, in level readers, in all sorts of materials. So then we started exploring WhatsApp. So what we did basically, we added those picture into these stories and sending links on the WhatsApp, uh, on SMS messages uh, and links for the WhatsApp. And that got really popular uh, because, uh, you know, children can see all these beautiful pictures. They can listen to the stories. Second thing what we did, uh, because our staff was sitting at home. So what we did, uh, so who to read those stories? So rather than going for, you know, outsourcing all that, uh, which was very difficult at that time, again, we use our own staff. Uh, and whatever material, you know, uh, technical uh, sort of equipment is available to them, uh, like their mobile phones, like their uh, laptops. So they recorded stories and these stories were shared through SMS, through WhatsApp. And then slowly and gradually, we built upon that one uh, to extend our you know, audience. Uh, so we did some surveys, tried to find out how many people have Android telephone, how many have very simple, you know, mobile phones. Uh, and then we add up different technologies uh, to reach those, you know, teachers and students uh, gradually. And uh, we used IVR. Uh, we used, for example, radio. Uh, we had a contract with the Pakistan Broadcast. Uh, who has the maximum range uh, coverage uh, all over Pakistan, about 8 million people. Uh, so we broadcasted 103 stories on radio and rebroadcasted them every week in five languages. Uh, so that, that's a little story of our, you know, COVID-related work. These are fantastic examples of best practices. I would also be curious if you found ways for learners to engage back with the materials that they were consuming over radio, over WhatsApp? Were there ways for them to ask questions or talk with the educators? That's right. As, as I said, you know, we, we basically evolve. Uh, and I'm very pleased to share. I think we are among the world, I think, in uh, anywhere in the world. We were the first one, like within literally within two to three weeks uh, when schools were closed, uh, we were using all these technologies. Uh, so whatever resources uh, available to us, we started uh, using them and reaching to teachers and students. And then we also introduced uh, webinars uh, for our teachers. Uh, and they went really well, uh, you know, got a, quite a lot of attraction uh, from teachers. And these were the webinars uh, pretty much like an online classrooms. So where, you know, master trainers or resource persons are there, where teachers participate, uh, they choose the topic uh, collaboratively. Uh, and what we did basically, not all the teachers were very uh, handy with using like Zoom or, you know, other uh, online resources. So we organized some orientation sessions uh, initially for them so they can feel comfortable uh, using all these technologies. And then uh, uh, we started talking to them. What topics do they feel are important uh, for them? Uh, we chose those topics, and then we created some less, you know, sessions on that. And they become so famous. Initially, we thought like uh, a session, for example, for 40 teachers, but we have to redo each uh, and every webinar session for teachers at least eight to 10 times uh, because there were so many teachers we cannot accommodate uh, in one session. Uh, so in one session, maximum you can accommodate from 25 to 30 uh, teachers. So we have to redo these, uh, these sessions almost eight to 10 times. So uh, that's how we basically started interacting with teachers. Then we also uh, started to track, uh, you know, the, and get the feedback uh, from uh, teachers, from community members, from students, mainly through uh, telephonic uh, surveys. And that also helped us to basically uh, be flexible with our approaches and come up with new things. For example, after that, uh, we introduced uh, a storytelling session, uh, a live storytelling session for kids, where kids can participate in that. Uh, we call it Dadi Amma, a great mother, a grandmother telling a story. And children can, you know, directly interact, uh, ask questions and uh, get answers. So that become very popular. Uh, after the webinars uh, with teachers, uh, uh, we got feedback. And then we thought, why not, uh, you know, go for 
some virtual uh, teacher inquiry group sessions, uh, which we used to do in our re regular training. So we started all those sessions too. Uh, and uh, initially we went for only uh, Urdu and Sindhi uh, uh, for our radio programs and for stories. Uh, but we had material available in other local languages too, like Pashto, like Balochi and Brahavi. So after having the feedback from the audience, we started, uh, you know, sending those stories too. And we also st recorded uh, audio stories, which were broadcasted in the radios in all these languages too. Great. Well, it really sounds like a lot of your dynamic shifts responding to the challenges of the pandemic were made possible because you've built trusting relationships with so many community members and educators leading up to in, in, in the decades of work that the IRC has been doing in Pakistan. Uh, leading up to th this moment. And I think there would be many partnership building best practices that others can learn from your experiences. And I'd be curious for, for those of us who don't know the context as well, uh, first to better understand how localized the decisions are made at the school or district level. And if you would share a bit then more about how you've been able to build customized partnerships at the local level in a way that can scale across the country? I think I just, uh, for, to answer that question, I really need to uh, give a little context of our original program because COVID really started at the end. Uh, reading was when we started working on reading, uh, particularly early grade reading, uh, and we wanted to introduce phonic-based reading and uh, teaching uh, in the classroom. That was pretty new concept in Pakistan. Uh, so initially when we started our work, in back in 2013 uh, the, the biggest challenge was at that time uh, most of the uh, secretaries uh, or the authorities uh, to whom we contacted with uh, they were mostly interested in buildings uh, they were mostly uh, mostly interesting in construction you know more classrooms toilets and very rightly so our furnitures and all these sort of things uh, and when it comes to teacher training the interest was in mathematics, uh, for example, or in science or in English. And uh, it was very difficult for people to understand why they need support in Urdu uh, reading improvement. Uh, so that's where we used a lot of literature and research which was available. Uh, and that helped us to convince them. And once this, uh, you know, all started, other important thing was uh, when we started our program, we didn't try to do anything uh, in parallel to the existing system uh, within the government structures. So for example, when we designed our uh, teaching learning material, uh, we did the analysis uh, for textbooks and available curriculums with the government officials. What are the gaps, uh, particularly uh, with respect to reading and learning in the early grade uh, classrooms? And that's where they all realize. Another important thing I think uh, which helped us, uh, that was a USAID initiative. USAID did a very interesting and uh, I think important thing uh, there. Even before awarding the project, they conducted a baseline uh, in reading. And when we shared these results, baseline results with the government officials, that was a really eye opener for them. Uh, and then they realized, you know, the grade two students, uh, probably six, 70%, 80% of the students cannot read a single sentence, uh, even in their local languages, and they have already graduated, uh, are probably, you know, in some cases, in some provinces, 40 to 50% grade two students have zero scores, like they cannot read a single word. Uh, so the oral frequency was so low. And these are the things which were really, you know, touching an eye opener to them and made them realize that how reading is important and how it can open the gate to other learnings. So like read to learn and learn to read. And that's where our journey started. So other important thing was from the very beginning, we formed the committees from the government. We call them steering committees, our advisory committees, technical committees, and government authorities were the part of that. So our job was to facilitate the process, to understand what the gaps are, what needs to be done. and uh, the decisions were taken collectively. So we just provide them information, data, so they can take decisions. And that really helped us to get the ownership uh, within the system. 
So for example, when we developed the materials, so we really didn't develop the material. We facilitated them, we oriented them, we provide them technical support. And these are the government officials, like textbook writers, curriculum people. We collected them, trained them, and they developed the material and they develop all these things in local languages. And that is where it was very easy for us to get the relevant approvals uh, and get the ownership, which was important for us to start the program. Another important thing is like, for example, for teacher training programs, we uh, work in uh, schools, uh, in districts, and that's where we involve district education officials. Uh, when we design our tra teacher training program, we respected uh, provincial and regional and district governments, uh, their structures, and try not to introduce anything parallel to their system. Try to work within the system and find the solution from there. And that really helped us. So we designed the model together. Uh, so we basically facilitated them to reach a decision. So our typical teacher training model consists of four important pillars. One is basically face-to-face -face training, where teachers were invited in the first year, like five days, introduce the concept, give the material, everything. Then they go back to the schools, and then we form small clusters, uh, eight to 10 teachers, where they can work in the vicinity of their schools together. And that is where when they practice whatever they learn into the face-to-face -face learning program, when they get together, they share their experiences, peer learning, peer sharing, their challenges, their difficulties, their successes. And every month they meet for three to four hours. And these were all very guided. We provided them all the material and everything. Then the third thing was school support visits. So what we did, basically, we identified, with the help of the district education officials, some senior teachers, some master trainers who we can train, and they can support uh, teachers in their schools. We call them mentors. So they identified them, we trained them, and facilitated them so they can get to the schools. So every school get at least one visit from a mentor in one quarter. Then in parallel to that, we hire school support associates, young graduates, uh, Pakistani graduates. Uh, they were also trained. So they and mentor, they go to the schools and meet and talk to the teachers with their individual needs, uh, whatever challenges and difficulties they had, so they can provide the solutions to them. And the number fourth thing was material. Before PRP in Pakistan, in classrooms, there were only textbooks that were available. And they were also not really you know, it's like an old fashioned textbook material. And that's the only source the public school students have. So very first time the material was developed uh, on the basis of scope and sequence. What needs to come first? What needs to come second? What needs to introduce? How alphabets need to introduce? And the sound base or phon phonic base instruction, a teaching and assessment that was very first time introduced. So we the material which we developed that includes, for example, level readers, so they can cater the needs of different uh, categories of students, early uh, beginners or mediocres or excellent students. Then they have big books. Then they have, for example, lesson plans. Just to give you an idea, for example, for a complete two academic years, grade one and grade two, in each of the language uh, which I was talking about, we develop material in about seven languages. So in each of the language, like in Urdu, we develop about 288 lesson plans, which have examples, activities, and they were provided to teachers. And all of these 1.7 million students, which we reached, they already they also received workbooks. So they're all lined up with the lesson plans. Then teachers have additional material like level readers, big books, and all that, flashcards. In addition to that, to every teacher, we provided a tablet, which was loaded with all that material. And that also has sounds. As I said, it's a seven year story. It, it could be as long as I can be, but you, one need to understand the context of Pakistan. Pakistan is quite a big country. Different languages are spoken here. A lot of local languages. Urdu is our national languages, language, but only about eight to 10% people, uh, you know, speak it as a native uh, language. For all of other people, it is a second language, a third language. So teachers even have a pronunciation problem while they are teaching Urdu. So those tablets and the sounds of the letters and syllables, that really helped them a lot. So we distributed about 27,000 tablets with all these materials. 
and these materials were regularly updated as we developed that. So that was our little story about how we get and involved and how we get the ownership of the government. Great. So, you know, there's there's a lot of lessons there to be learned around the creation of native language, reading materials, and it sounds like also a lot of learnings around the cultural and behavioral shifts required to engage educators to prioritize literacy education in new ways. You mentioned this point, right? It's not just about the creation of the material itself, but also making it available and accessible to folks. And I'd be curious to, to learn more. I, I know that the PRP introduced a mobile bus library visiting schools on a preset schedule. Would you help paint a picture of what happens when the mobile bus library comes to a school, Sana? Thank you. Um, so just adding before going into this amazing uh, methodology of you using mobile library buses, I think that uh, apart from creating the ownership, it was also the design. It was attractive to children. Children were a part of developing how things were appealed. We, we tried really very hard to also, let's say, let's say, not break culture uh, norms, but for sure, driving a, a gender perspective in all of our materials. And it was colorful, dynamic, and all of that. And I think that played a huge role for how well it was received by our children um, and teachers. Yeah, what do you say? Um, you are in a, in a stand in front of a gate, which is in steel, uh, protective walls, and you hear a honk. The door is opening and in drives a little bus, which is um, a, a sparkle uh, in, in maybe some dull environments at times, actually. And um, the bus were, of course, redesigned, uh, both in terms of color, but also how it was functional. So when the bus comes in, the door is opening, the stairs is coming down, and you enter into the magic world of reading and learning together actually with also technical, uh, you know, uh, videos and all of that so that you could actually visualize and see things as well. So, and after that, the teachers, the headmasters came out with the children, super organized as always. And one by one, the children entered in and could pick what they wanted to read. And I think for me, when I, when I was around uh, the books, uh, the library uh, bus, it was really that it became silent. First, the excitement of going in and lend the book, but then sitting outside reading. And in the corner, you could see actually parents who many of them were actually illiterate themselves, just in the same magic, looking at the books, trying to understand what their children were embracing and learning. So I think it was um, it was literally a, a, a joy arriving into an already joyful environment because uh, true. Um, as well is that the teachers we have been working with have just been magical workers, deep respect for the children, deep respect for learning, and with a true honest will of actually giving reading skills to the children. So I think that uh, the library bus just amplified that and, and it gave a, a moment of something different, um, especially for children who are not exposed to libraries in their everyday life, libraries which were made for them. It was actually, produce so that they would find it attractive, that they would like to come back. Um, so I think that that was really, and for us, it was a great moment when the uh, local provinces actually asked to take over the buses and run them by themselves um, because they saw the impact it had. So I think, again, it, it was a way to actually create sustainability and to show that with rather small means, it is possible to, to make a change. You know, the IRC began working in Pakistan in 1980, yes. right, following the arrival of Afghan refugees. I have one last question for you, which is, um, at, at what point would you say your work in Pakistan is done? I think when we know for sure that children and adults are having the access to the services we believe every human being have the right to, and that this education is, of course, a super critical element. But then in many parts of the country, uh, there is still a lot of poverty and, and it's poverty in terms of access to, um, of course, services, but it's also actually livelihoods, access to health and all of that. So we, we are honored that the Pakistani government are willing to work with us. Uh, it, it's the base and the foundation. We want to be bringing in added value. And, and so far, uh, we see an, an amazing collaboration with the Pakistani government. and. Um, 
I think there, there is a little bit of work to be done. Uh, we are looking to the sustainable development goals and, and we want them to be achieved. Uh, till they are, we will be there working hand in hand with all local actors and of course, embracing international relationships we have with donors like USAID and, and the Library of Congress as too, of course, because there's a lot of learning and we learn every day and we are thankful for the collaboration we have. Fantastic. Well, thank you for this opportunity to, to speak with you and to learn from you. I um, really am I'm very grateful for this, this chance. And I think a lot of folks will have many things to learn from what you've shared with us today. So thank you. Thank you.